is a democratic state, have a historical and ethical and legal obligation to ensure the social and economic welfare of all South Africans, and mines carry a specific obligation to the people who are directly impacted by their mining operations. As the MPRDA correctly says in its objective, it's that the holders of mining rights have an obligation to contribute towards the socioeconomic development of the areas in which they operate because they have a direct impact on communities. They pollute the water, they pollute the air, they remove our heritage and our culture. And so there is a price to be paid there. So we're saying essentially that it is urgent and absolutely necessary for this portfolio committee to start the process of engaging in legislative reform, to bring into line the elements that we lost through the judgment. We need to get those elements into law in order to hold mining companies to account. We do, however, support the call by Mancosa for a transformation council that includes community, labor, industry, and the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy so that all parties can meet quarterly, at least quarterly, to discuss transformation in a structured and consistent way, and so that hopefully they can lead towards a legislative proposal that would be broadly acceptable to all the parties, but specifically uh, to redress the shortcomings of the current legislation with regards to transformation and development of communities. We do reject the claim by Mancosa that the problem uh, that the mining charter judgment has, um, has uncovered is, is merely one of a lack of standardized reporting. Instead, our research shows that there is a fundamental lack of focus on the developmental objectives and the place of communities within that process. So if the law is not mandating companies to and requiring companies to engage with communities in a more consistent and concerned way, then they will continue to ignore the developmental objectives and imperatives that, uh, that comes with a mining license. And we say this can only be remedied if the MPRDA is most explicit in its intentions to ensure that transformation and if there are severe con and, and that there are severe consequences for non-compliance, together with greater transparency and greater rights afforded to communities um, to engage and hold mining companies to account. So in essence, Chair, that is our uh, submission on the mining charter. So that's why we weren't too worried about the previous time that we took uh, in that this was relatively short, but I'm sure that the committee might have some questions around this still. Thank you, Chair. No, 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 do, do them both, Chris. Okay, yes. I can do them both, yes, yes. Um, okay. Then as regards to uh, artisanal mining, um, I'm going to hand over to, to uh, uh, Pops Latoka in a little while, but let me just frame uh, our, our contribution in this way. That as far back as 2016, Makua had called and hosted a conference, which we believe was the very first conference in South Africa to exclusively discuss the issue of artisanal miners. Because it was very clear to us from our working communities that this question of artisanal miners was uh, a challenge because they were being criminalized. You know, black bodies being criminalized is not new in South Africa, but it is uh, problematic. Um, and so we, we, we raised this issue together with the fact that we had been approached by miners in Kimberley, artisanal miners in Kimberley, and uh, we had started to work with them where we mobilized thousands of artisanal miners um, to go to the DMRE and to demand that they be legalized. As many of you know, eventually um, those miners were granted a permit to mine. They're still mining today. Um, and it has gone some way into um, at least addressing that immediate crisis that was emerging in Kimberley at the time. So, Here's an example of a area that needs to be legislated, 
which wasn't dealt with adequately in the NPRDA, and which we engaged the DMRE as far back as 2016 on the need to amend the legislation to deal with this question. As the timeline shows that the DMRE uh, failed to deal with it uh, in, a, in, a, in a, an appropriately urgent manner. Um, instead, in 2017, we made a submission to the Minerals and Petroleum Board with regards to the need to regulate the artisanal mining sector. And then we heard nothing further up until um, we, we took note that the DMRE started a process in 2018 to do comparative research projects uh, in other jurisdictions on, with regards to how they dealt with the ASM sector. We ourselves with the Wits University and Action, is, Action, Action Aid South Africa, we undertook a scoping exercise of the artisanal mining sector. That uh, information is available to, to the portfolio committee. Uh, it's on our website and we're happy to share that. It was, which in our opinion, and we haven't seen anything else yet in the sector, the most extensive um, survey of artisanal mining um, which showed how the, the economy was being developed through this artisanal mining process, how these miners at the local level were generating income, how that income was spreading into the community, adding value, and in essence, doing what the MPRDA set out to do, which is to distribute the wealth of the mineral resources in a way that the NPRDA is not able to do. The NPRDA is very much focused on large scale mining operations. It has an element of small scale operations, small scale mining. But there again, we're talking about in terms of artisanal mining, those are big projects which artisanal miners are not able to access. But artisanal mining does offer us that opportunity. And, and, and that research shows it very clearly how artisanal mining impacts with the extent of it, where they're located, how they're located, what the size of the sector is and so forth. So we've done that research, it's there. Um, that research led to a process of engagement with artisanal miners and eventually Makua together with um, Action Aid and others, um, we worked with um, miners to form the Association of Artisanal Miners, the National Association of Artisanal Miners. Uh, Paps Latorka, who is a member of Makua, is also the chairperson of the National Association of Artisanal Miners. So he will speak to that in a minute. Um, and then by 2020, the DMR started to invite us to make comments on their draft policy. And by 2021, they published the draft policy and 2022, we are now sitting with uh, what can only be termed a bit of a crisis. So here's a process where we alerted the DMRE in 2016 to the need to adjust um, the, the, the law so that we can deal with this challenge. Um, and by 2022, we are no clearer to dealing with it. So we hope that the MPRDA is not gonna go through a similar crisis where the opportunity to amend things with foresight is not taken so that we can avoid the crisis that is obviously coming at us uh, at the end of this tunnel. So we say that there are four key areas of, uh, that, that drive uh, this problem of artisanal mining or informal miners, or as some like to call it illegal mining, because there are illegal mining operations happening. We don't deny that. The, we have high unemployment. At the same time, we have over 6,000 abandoned mines and unused mines that are just sitting there under care and maintenance. We have high levels of inequality and low levels of regulation. So those four factors, we believe, come together in a way that is brewing this growing storm of illegal mining. We say that the solution lies in utilizing these problems, these challenges, and bringing them together to use ASM to reduce unemployment, rehabilitate abandoned mines at the same time, and uh, make unused mines um, active again. In this way, we distribute wealth to a broad base of people, not to an elite base, to a broad base of people. It gives people uh, 
something tangible to do. It gives them purpose. And when somebody has purpose and is working productively, they become, or they have the potential to become uh, productive citizens. So we're saying that's the way for us to go. Um, we believe that the, the draft mining, um, mining policy has some good things in it, but as we've indicated to the DMRE before, there are a number of problems still that remains. So having said all that, um, I'm going to hand over to, um, to Pops to deal with this in, in more detail. Um, but before I do that, um, let us say, I will leave this particular slide to the end uh, where we can wrap the conversation up. So um, Comrade Pups, would you like to come in at this point and just speak to your practical experience um, in terms of how you've experienced uh, working at the coal face of artisanal mining? Uh, thank you very much, Comrade Chris. Uh, my name is Pups, Sean Letopo. I'm from the National Association of Artisanal Miners. It's an organization of men and women in, from mining communities of South Africa who are practicing a subsistence form of work through self-regulation using rudimental tools to extract minerals to put bread on the table for themselves and their families. Uh, as Chris has already uh, mentioned that in 2019, uh, we established uh, this association for the <clears throat> voice of artisanal miners to advocate for the plight of men and women who are practicing artisanal mining in South Africa. So yes, uh, in response to our, our request to the DMRE to decriminalize the sector and legalize and also have the a policy that will regulate the sector. Uh, the MRA responded, I think it was on the uh, high stages of level one in 2020. Uh, they started with the development of uh, artisanal scale mining policy. So the challenge that we, uh, I, will, I will highlight the, 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 the challenges that or, or, or this uh, one of the things that uh, some of the clause that we made a submission on, and we found that at the uh, final policy, some of the uh, uh, concerns that were, were 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 incorporated on the draft before are missing. So our challenge is also with regards to the, our challenge on the ground is with regards to the implementation uh, of the formalization of the, of, of the artisanal scale mining operations. Since uh, there is no structure in place that is formed to implement so there's no implementation structure uh, in place until to date. So the problem that we are having is that the policy is not be, uh, uh, being amended into, into law. We, uh, it shows the final stages to, to the parliament and also the attention of the president to sign the policy into law. So since we have uh, alluded that we were part of the policy development, uh, or, or, uh, part of the policy development stages. So what we are experiencing on the ground is that uh, artisanal miners on the ground are trying to align themselves with the final policy uh, that was uh, that was issued and published on March the 31st, I think. Uh, artisanal 
scale operations on the ground. They have uh, take took efforts to 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 formalize themselves. So so the problem is that uh, they are doing that process in silos. The DMRE is just not coming on board, and also the Mineral Council as artisanal miners on the ground. They are they are met with the resistance from the large scale mining companies. For example, one of our branches uh, in Clackstop, who are going by the name of Kosh Artisanal Miners, they have uh, registered a cooperative uh, as the uh, final policy recommends that a group of artisanal miners uh, permits should be given to a group of artisanal miners who have registered cooperatives. So uh, artisanal miners on the ground are having a problem that of, of, of implementing the process because they are the one who are, uh, are practicing this activity and the, the rest of it is felt by them. So they find themselves being more proactive than the government and the, 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 the Mineral Council itself when it comes to the implementation of the policy, as it recommends that all the stakeholders must work together to implement. So, of course, artisanal miners are having experience of uh, uh, resistance from uh, Harmony Gold, because where they are operating, uh, it's also Harmony, um, uh, Harmony Gold is also operating. So they are having a problem where uh, on the dams that they are uh, working on, uh, Harmony Gold is, 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 is not coming forth to the table. And also we are having a problem that the D, uh, regional DMR is on the ground. They are not in sync of what the national uh, DMRE is doing with regards to artisanal small scale mining uh, policy. So the branches on the ground, they will, uh, they will have, they, they are having a, a challenge that whenever they are going to their regional offices, uh, the regional offices, they don't, they, 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 they don't have any uh, directive. They don't know on how they can go on because of the there is no structure there is no implementation structure in place to help artisanal miners on the ground so they are they they they, they are met with with, with, with uh, more human rights violations uh, uh, they are still experiencing uh, police brutality in all of our branches that are uh, are taking efforts to formalize. They are working in silos. There's no DMRE that supports them. Uh, there's no also uh, uh, large-scale mine companies that support them. So they uh, they are still uh, uh, met with resistance and they are being uh, harassed by the police. As also we have also realized that also the SAPS members are not aware of uh, the efforts that the government has an, uh, embarked on with regards to addressing the challenges of artisanal mining. So those branches that uh, has the desire to 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 to, to formalize and to see uh, a consistent and transparent policy in place that will manage the and facilitate their operations, they are having a problem of 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 of. of resistance and from, 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 from other government departments that are not in sync with, 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 with the DMRE's uh, plan on uh, uh, formalizing, for formalizing and decriminalization of artisanal mining. So all that bedding for, to, 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 to give awareness to all this uh, stakeholder department, it is left with uh, National Association itself to make sure that they are giving a policy awareness to, 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 to this uh, uh, lower uh, government department uh, 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 stakeholders. So also the issue that we are having on the ground is also the, 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 the uh, through during the policy development, the stigmatization also issue was left out. It was never addressed on the policy on how our, uh, the government is going to 
to deal with the issue of stigmatization because uh, currently also what we have found out was that uh, many people uh, still uh, 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 regard artisanal mining and, 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 and informal illegal mining as they cannot differentiate. So there is a definition, a definition concept that also we are struggling with it on the ground. And also the issue of how to, uh, 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 to, 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 of, of first come first serve, because people who are actually practicing this artisanal small scale mining are, are not that privileged. So we know that uh, the loss of first come first serve, it is, it will work against uh, the objective of, of, of creating uh, 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 employment for these distressed mining communities. And so that, that, that is also the issue that we are having a problem with because we know that uh, people who are having uh, the muscle to, 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 to arrive first uh, at the DMR offices and get the permits are those who are already uh, rich. And also the issue of hectares wa, 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 uh, 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 oh was of a concern to, 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 to National Association of Artisanal Miners and also the issue of permits to be reserved to only national, uh, South African uh, nationals is also uh, giving us the problem on the ground since on the ground we know that uh, uh, artisanal miners are, are, are not only uh, South African nationals and for the fact that large scale mining has been uh, uh, using uh, nat other nationalities from, from 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 outside our country, and there was never a problem with regards to that. So, why it should be an issue when it comes to uh, artisanal uh, scale mining? So we see it as something that is going to create a problem uh, in future if it is left out without not being addressed properly. I uh, will pause there for now and probably maybe uh, wait for the questions if there are questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Pops. Che, if I can then just, just wrap this up very briefly then to say that um, in our view, artisanal miners have never been recognized within the current mining regulation. The MPRDA, as it currently stands, excludes artisanal miners. Um, and one of the concerns that we have is that there has been a broad effort to criminalize those who are engaged in artisanal mining activities without really understanding the drivers of it and, and, and how artisanal mining is in the long term able to contribute to the South African economy and dealing with the question of unemployment and wealth distribution. Um, we are of the view that the discrimination against poor and marginalized communities. Sorry, sorry. sorry about that. We are of the view that the discrimination against poor and marginalized communities um, is an inherent feature in the MPRDA regulations. Um, and we say that this is part of the problem, is that the MPRDA is currently stand is geared towards large scale miners, which is a legacy of our past um, and, and, and fails to deal with the marginalized and poor communities, uh, which is supposed to serve. So we are of the view that if we do not address this discrimination, subtle discrimination within the MPRDA, which excludes communities to, to a larger extent. We feel that many of the class discriminations inherent in the MPRDA will continue to be advanced in the draft regulations proposed by the, by the, by the DMRE um, in that when it talks about reserving ASM permits for locals, there's no similar regulation 
that is contemplated in terms of large scale miners. Large scale miners are able to come in and they're able to um, extract the wealth of our country. Uh, and there's no reservation with regards to only locals. In fact, part of the problem of transformation sits in about how do we increase South African, uh, Black South African um, representation in the ownership structures. Um, so we think that it, it, it's uh, unfair, it's discriminatory, and it shows a class bias in the way that the, the MPRDA is structured towards large scale mining. So people and groups like uh, PUPS, who are local South Africans who are working and trying to legitimately put food on the table. Um, and you know, if there are minors who have work permits and are here legally, they should not be discriminated against in that way. And the, 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 the separation between legal, uh, legal legality and and, and, and nationality should be separated. Um, so it's not a question of just if you are a foreign national that you shouldn't be able to access it, but it should be a question of have you got your papers in order and that kind of thing. So um, we think that uh, there needs to be a greater emphasis to understand the local conditions and, 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 and what is driving artisanal mining. Um, there is no way we are going to police our way out of this problem. Um, policing is important. And yes, uh, the efforts by the minister and the SAPs to form specialized units must be welcomed because of the deep levels of criminality that has been allowed to, to, um, to emerge underground, really. From underground, they merged to the top. And when they came to the top and started to affect people uh, directly uh, in a public way, then it only became a problem. But this is not something that artisanal miners are, are, are new to. The problem sits in the fact that the sector was not regulated. Where the sector is not regulated, there is a vacuum. And where there is a vacuum, power actors will emerge to fill that vacuum. And this is what is happening in the sector. The sector has not been regulated. There's not been a plan to work alongside um, law-abiding citizens like uh, PUPS and the Kosh, the Kosh uh, Cooperative um, so that they can also act as part of the regulatory process. So where there are legitimate miners, you can rest assured that they will work in, 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 in in harmony with police to ensure that their interests are protected and that the rule of law is um, put in place. But where we are going to blanket a, a term and say that every artisanal miner is a criminal and therefore must be um, and therefore must be imprisoned, that presents a problem. So we urge the portfolio committee to, to insist that, that with the DMRE, that this process must move forward, but it must move forward in a way that is going to build because you cannot, the part that has taught us that you cannot police your way out of a crisis. We have to find ways in which we utilize the our existing strengths, the people that we have, the willingness to work within the system, the need to put food on the table, the need to distribute the wealth, Bring all of those elements together and we can make a sector that, that works for the country and, and, and really produces a productive outcome. Um, so that's essentially our approach to the question. Um, and we hope that it will find favor amongst the committee. And all that remains now, uh, Chair, is to say that we thank the committee for your time and for um, being open to, to listening to our views. And like you said, you know, we don't have to agree on everything, but hopefully um, a discussion can pursue an ongoing engagement. So in other words, we hope that this is not the last of it, that over a period of time, we will be able to work with the portfolio committee to come to outcomes that are going to be in the interest of all of the country um, and in our case, specifically in the interest of affected communities. So thank you very much, Chair. 
Thank you, Makua. Thank you, Amua. Uh, thanks, Chris, and your team, uh, Mr. Mbangola. Um, I think uh, <clears throat> this is what is good for South Africans. From time to time, we must be able to find one another. <clears throat> I don't want, I'll, I'll make my comments later and uh, my area of worries. First, let me check from the honorable members. Are there any questions of clarity, both from the mining charter or comments and um, the issue of um, illegal mining? I prefer to use that word, Chris. I'll tell you why when I make my own comment or questions. Is there any hand? Going one, going two, going three. Okay, there is none. First, let me appreciate your, your inputs. <clears throat> let me start first on the issue of the, of the mining charter. <clears throat> the, the first thing that I think we have to check whether we find one another. And I think you have, you have highlighted in your input on the mining chart. The first question for me, and there has been standing from what the Minerals Council had been saying, that uh, in the absence or in the, in the absence of an approved uh, legally mining charter, what becomes the status of the mining charter and the uh, the compliance requirements. And <clears throat> I'm raising this thing because one of the things we've raised with the Minerals Council was that it seems from their side, every time they make an argument is that uh, there's too much regulation. And let's agree all of us will differ from time to time. Uh, those who want to maximize profit, when you try to manage that, they will then tell you you are doing too much and those who also wants to cut the maximization of profit will feel that you are not going at a pace that. So I don't think we have to. My, my only concern is that I would have thought you will assist us on how do we tackle currently the uncertainty on the mining charter as to whether it is enforceable or not. That's the first issue. The second thing is that I hope I had it, but I didn't hear it to be saying how I understand English is a, it's a very complex thing because you can say something, but somebody won't hear you. <clears throat> what is your attitude as Makua Amoa with regards to the audit uh, timelines? For an example, part of the problem in the mining charter has been that compliance with the requirements of the charter which was at some point over 10 years period, is that the, the only time where you've got an outcome of compliance on an outcome will be on the last year. There are no in, intervals where you say at this pace, for instance, if the department comes and present, it's a, a annual targets and annual performance, but also it's, it's, it's term uh, of targets then annually to have to put something within that annual period to have quarterly uh, reports that, that we can be able to measure and say, at this pace you are going, one, in this financial year, you won't be, be able to meet your annual targets. You, 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 you will dismally fail in terms of your annual performance. But lastly, in terms of your expenditure patterns, you won't be able to achieve what you have placed for yourself to achieve. And when we look at that over your five-year period, which is your term, you won't be able to meet those targets that you have set for yourself over the term. <clears throat> what is the attitude of Makua Amoa with regards to the lack of uh, term measurements on the performance and the fact that that mining charter currently leaves an uncertainty on its status of enforceability? The third area that I think I, I want you to say open because I'm raising this in conjunction with the first part and I'm not intending to, to, to revoke what you are saying uh, or the past of misunderstanding. <clears throat> the nature of the performance of a portfolio committee is obviously subject. The first thing, like I said, even when we're at our meeting, that 
Don't you think at some point, let me put this broader question. Don't you think at some point, regardless who takes the first initiative, we need to look at the system that we adopted uh, post 1994. I'm raising this thing because you are talking to a committee, leave this committee, but generally, you are talking to a, a parliament that has got the least budget compared to the least budget of the departments, but it is expected to provide and conduct oversight. Don't you think we adopted, put it simple, don't you think that we adopted a executive friendly system as far as governance is concerned? And how do we attend to that? So that the issues that you are raising, the third point, the fourth point, which is linked to this in terms of this, don't you think all of us have a duty, including particularly yourselves as key stakeholders, uh, I regard, and I said, we don't see you as enemies, but as strategic partners that can guide from time to time, depending how we relate, because that's a different story. But don't you think that there is a problem that where the actual accountability has to take place? For instance, when the committee was conducting the gas amendment bill, one of the things we realized was that in most of the areas where we're going, they would not have been, I'm not saying there were no interaction with yourselves as the stakeholder. On the point that we're raising on legislation, we may not, we may not at least talk about prior drafting by the department, the executive authority. But let's talk about the, our view has been, let me put it from a committee point of view that before the committee of parliament goes, they must at least have been within the executive authority, a comprehensive consultative process on what it is proposing. So that the points that you are talking about to say, yes, you want to amend this, or you want to put this thing that is new. Our view is this. I think at times where there is the conflict start is that only when the committee of parliament takes what now has been presented. Unfortunately, that's what the legislative process of parliament says. It says a committee can decide whether it wants to do public consultations or not. Now, in most of these situations is that when you arrive there, we find that there is for the first time and there's nothing in law that says the same way parliament com committees are supposed to conduct uh, public hearings, it is supposed to be the case with the executive. I'm saying part of the things that might arise now out of the, our experience of the gas amendment bill is that there has to be a an, uh, an concerted effort, how it is done procedurally. It's something else that even the executive must conduct similar exercises as the committee does. But firstly, as we make this proposal, how can we manage? Because some of the things we're talking about are more technical. For an example, we may like to, to say, I may give you an example where we were the misunderstanding. We may like to say we're going to KZN. When you go to KZN, your wish is to go to Hammersdale. I'm making an example, or is to go to any part of uh, a Tegwini municipality, whether Msinyati, which is uh, 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 in the north, but you are dependent on that municipality, but also you are dependent to those who claim, who say are the stakeholders, to say this is where we think you can, because the issue of mobilization of people and the organization of venues primarily becomes a responsibility of the municipalities. Don't you think that we have, we have to some degree unable, unable all of us to manage the issue of cooperative governance and accountability as far as, because ordinarily you come to explain a legislation. The actual people are your ward councillors and others that are supposed to be responsible for this exercise. We are saying we want you to look at a broad input that can assist 
so that even ourselves, when we go to the broader or other structures, forums of parliament that deal with these things, we can raise, for instance, we understand what you say, but it is not clear as an alternative how within the procedures of parliament we can, can, can go there to say, for an example, it should it, I make an example, shouldn't it be so, so and so with high authority who write and say, this committee is coming, this is what is expected from you, part of cooperative arrangement. I'm raising this not that you must substitute what you are supposed to do, but I think from a public point of view, when some of these things come in, it might be, they may even make more sense that they are coming from, from, from civil society. So that is one part with far as the mining charter is concerned. And I take the points uh, with regards to the, 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 the other issues. I think we can take. Now, let me be straightforward on the illegal mining. Don't we think that there's a difference? One, that different type of illegal mining, call it illegal or informal mining. I take, I don't think for me, polishing up the police, by the way, I might say now, you are more advantageous even compared to the committee because the committee deals mainly with legislative issues. And that is why when the uh, Minerals Council says the mining charter is a policy, not a legislation, uh, uh, one of the things was, okay, if you say so, so in order for it, for you to comply, you must make it a legislation. So if that's what they're asking for, I think this, uh, the committee must, uh, must, must take that request that until you make it a legislation, we're not going to comply with, with it. And, and that's the issue then we can start to deal with the modalities. But I'm saying, don't we think that, and I agree 100% with artisanal mining, shouldn't we separate artisanal mining from illegal mining? But also, shouldn't we be careful to make illegal mining all being criminal? But also, shouldn't we be careful to make, not to make illegal mining all not to be criminal? I'm, I'm raising this thing because, for an example, uh, if we take the example of um, uh, Northern Cape, uh, where the, there was a conversion to artisanal mining, I think it's one good living example. But in other areas, we must concede. This is why I'm worried about your four pillars. Your four pillars might be disrecognizing one of the biggest challenges that we are having, organized crime or criminal syndicates, so that we don't make illegal mining as if it is not criminal, but at times even give something that may be seen. And I'm saying this was extreme caution with the absence of a better word. If you go to people now to Prukaston and say out of even that incident that had taken place and say it is only as a result of the four pillars, they will, I doubt they will ever be one to hear that. There is a, there is, let's accept there is a reality that even some of our neighboring countries, which is why from a point of view of the discussion, is that should we treat the issue of illegal mining in particular, because I can compare artisanal mining to the Zamazamas. Shouldn't we deal with the issues the, even if we say it's illegal, the illegality is at different levels of what is actually the, real, the reality of the situation. Because if we're to say it's about poverty, it's about this, it's about this, some of the communities, when they complain, they are worst off under some of these conditions. And they may not even want to listen when you say, no, it is not, it is, it is something that is as their own creation. Shouldn't we separate some of these things and deal with them separately. Let me make an example. One, if you look at chrome, the activities, one might argue and say, you need to find a better fast-track system of making sure that people, even at a community level, are able to access licenses and everything so that they operate formally. But there are incidences of your drilling and ownerless mines that remain disused that even on your projections that you gave here, you, it, will be, it will be absurd to give and say artisanal mining can take place. 
Because in some of the areas where these illegal mining activities are taking place, they are a threat to residential spaces. One, two, they are a threat generally and a risk in society because in some of these cases, those mining activities are even in, include the mining of pillars. And we all know that in order for you, when you do mining, one of the things you must leave there for the balance, for, for to remain balanced, is to leave some of the pillars. You can't mine the pillars. And the incident that's currently was still sitting with it, trying to find a solution, to, which is the Lily Mine incident. Amongst the accusations that are being made was that the company that was responsible for mining there, for that to collapse is because they were now mining the pillars. So there, there are some risks that we, we may have to avoid. So I want us to look at those things and say, the question of illegality, it can't be a one size fits all. If I'm wrong, that's okay. But I want your, your, con your connection. That is one thing that we have identified. The second thing is that in, in some of the problems that you are having, is that what are we not are we not dealing with the low hanging fruits, not dealing with the tertiary problem? For an example, it's not easy to mine diamonds and carry diamonds and everything. It's very strict. Um, amongst the things that are a, a debate now, shouldn't we go to a very strict regulation of a gold as a commodity? Because that's where the actual violent part of of, 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 of illegal mining takes place. The third one, because even if always, even if you were to arrest hundreds of them, as long as you are not dealing with the high syndicates, which are the ones that might happen in one way or the other to be carrying formal, um, formal licenses, or if, if there's such a thing, or who might be legal, but the products they are carrying might be finding a way to be refined so that it becomes legal, not Ill in an illegal way. Shouldn't, uh, shouldn't we start to, to work on that? Uh, there is a talk, for an example, that uh, at an at a international level, we, gold must be categorized in that similar fashion, including from a UN and so forth. The last point on this issue of, of, of illegal mining is, is, is the fact that um, when you look at it, from, from, from the violent side of it. One of the things is the contradictions in legislation. Like you say from your MPRDA, let's take the Kruger Stone case, or let's take even uh, many of the other mines that active mining stops as soon as the PRPs, the business rescue practitioners come in. For a longer period, there's no activity. And in the absence of that activity, that's when attraction of um, uh, 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 illegal activities and territorial wars now, because it becomes more like a gangster platform. Uh, part of the things that are in consideration is how do we harmonize and reduce the period with regards to the issue of licensing and enforce the principle of use it or lose it and the ownership, regardless of business rescue practitioner interventions, have to be guided by giving more due recognition on the primary legislation responsible for licensing. I'm just throwing those things so that we, we may find that there are certain areas. For instance, on artisanal mining, I think you may have your take. There's generally a view in the policy that the limitation of artisanal mining is that it doesn't talk about underground mining. It talks more on, uh, on open cast, not necessarily on underground. I think some of those issues are things that we can say, let's find a mechanism. Uh, and if it means from a committee point of view, we invite the department to make it th this presentation with regards to, I think that's what we can do to the, to the draft policy on artisanal and small scale mining. I think that one is not, may not be a big, a, a big issue to do and then come back especially with the inputs that you have given us as shortcomings. I think that we will empower this committee. But I think let's accept, or shouldn't we talk about the bigger problems? Let me give it to you, uh, Makua, if, if there is any response or take you want to, to make uh, on these things. I was just raising the issue that 
in some areas, these communities believe that their own freedom or independence or way of life of living is taken away, not just been by undocumented, let's try and say, but all that they will tell you that it is not them and they don't want anything to do with what is taking place in that area. And therefore, perception might develop that the same victims we make as if they stand to benefit out of that exercise, or they are responsible for the criminal activities that are taking them. Let me hear your take, Mako uh, Amoa, uh, Chris. I thank you, Chair. That's uh, quite extensive. Thank you very much. Um, let me try and just deal systematically with some of the issues. And then I'm sure that um, if there are any things that I miss, our delegation will be able to just cover that. Um, so I, I guess the first question that you asked was regards to the status of the charter. Where does it stand? Um, look, our view, uh, Chairperson, is that after the, well, before the judgment, the mining charter was... Um, its effectiveness as a tool to measure transformation from our perspective, from a community development perspective, was not useful in the way that it was structured, in its, in its um, lack of consultation and the fact that it didn't have any clear, target, uh, clear targets in the sense of community development or penalties and so on. So we've dealt with that extensively where we say that the charter, even before it went to court, um, had its shortcomings, but at the same time, it was at, uh, probably going to be uh, the most effective way for us to, to advance transformation, as you correctly pointed out. If it is only a policy, then we will need to bring that policy into life through legislative uh, engagements or, or legislative changes. So that's the, the 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 challenge for the for the for the portfolio committee is that the mining charter has no legal standing. It is not something that we as communities can rely on. So we can't take a mining company to court and say, "Here's the mining charter. It's a legal obligation. They are supposed to deliver on X, Y, or Z. They haven't done it, and therefore we seek redress." We can't do that with the current mining charter. So for all intents and purposes. Um, as the court, if we are to accept the court's judgment, which we must, then the mining charter is merely a policy document. And I guess the Minerals Council is correct in that, uh, in that status. So we think it has no more legal standing than a policy would have. Uh, and as we know, policy is uh, limited because it doesn't, if it doesn't have legislative elements to it. So the need to, um, to amend the legislation to include transformative elements is critical um, and uh, urgent. Um, we are, are aware of the fact that the Minerals Council and most businesses generally um, in line with the free market uh, thinking believe that businesses should have no regulations, that it should be a free for all. We take as much as we can uh, and we don't wanna pay anybody for it and we wanna accumulate all the wealth and so on. We believe that that lack of a regulation is precisely part of the problem with regards to how wealth is accumulated in the sector. Um, because uh, the legislation doesn't regulate wealth distribution in, a, in an effective way, and which is what the mining chart, I guess, tries to deal with, even though we, we, we don't agree that wealth should just be distributed at an elite level, but it should be distributed at a broad-based level. Um, um, so, so we think that the Mining charter try to regulate wealth distribution and fair distribution of the nation's resources, but it it had its limitations. And now, after the judgment, it is even uh, less of an effective mechanism for us to do that. So it is urgent, more than urgent, that we need to address that legislative lacuna 
um, where now there is nothing that we can go to court on to hold mining companies to account. So it's a free for all in our social audits show this and it will only increase now that the mining charter has lost its legal status you know prior to that there was a general acceptance that it is law um, and that we have to abide by it and now there's just nothing absolutely nothing that holds people to account the only thing <clears throat> that we do have is the mining licenses which uh, obligates um, that a company must have a social and labor plan um, but again, it's unclear what it means if there is no social labor plan or if um, the company doesn't deliver on the social labor plan. So in terms of getting a mining license, all the company needs to do is to say, we promise to deliver you all of the things that we saw them promise. We're going to deliver these beautiful amounts of money and investments. And at the end of the day, we're just not going to do it. And you know what? There's nothing you can do because the law is not clear about what you can do. We've given you the paper is the next thing they're going to argue. And here's the paper. You said we must produce a social and labor plan. You never said we must deliver it. So there we go. So for us, it's very clear that is an urgent need to rectify that. Um, and so whether the, the, the Minerals Council like it or not, the fact of the matter is, is that they are the products of colonialism and apartheid. They owe a debt of obligation to this nation, to this people, to mining affected communities. And the Portfolio Committee, as a democratic parliament, has an obligation to ensure that that happens, according to our constitution. Um, so for us, there is no uncertainty around the mining charter anymore. The court has dispensed with that. It is very clear that the mining charter uh, has no standing and that the portfolio committee needs to just do something about it. Um, in terms of the audit timelines, um, look, we understand and appreciate that projects um, by its very nature needs time. And that the first part of a project is often the planning phase. And so you will not see much happen in the first year, most likely. Um, you might not even see something happen in the second year, but after the planning has been done, and if you've done your planning very well, uh, the project should be up within the third year, you know. So uh, a five-year timeline is, is workable, um, and it's not always helpful to, to, to measure it uh, in a micro way. Um, but the fact of the matter is, there has to be penalties, there has to be a level of compliance that is expected, mm -hmm. because Management is one thing, right? So managing it is one thing, but to expect the portfolio committee to manage it on a monthly, yearly basis, I think is, is asking a, a bit much of the portfolio committee, given as you correctly pointed out, Chair, that the portfolio committee has been combined. It's got two very big portfolios that it deals with, both minerals and energy, and it has a small budget, limited staff and limited time. So for us to expect the portfolio committee to do that kind of, of monitoring is just uh, not feasible. But what we do say- No, sorry, Chris, I, I don't want just, no, I don't do that. All that I was saying is that, don't you think that we should build in so that when we do the mining charter through the legislation, yes. we should build in timelines because the yes. problem with the current arrangement is that you don't have timelines. You only realize on the last end of the of, of the charter as I look that the, there is no compliance. And the fight yes. now becomes whether there is compliance or not. But if you yes. have a regular timeline, you will measure whether these people will meet. That's, that's the context. So. No, I, I, I do appreciate that, Chair. I'm going to get to that now and say that so yes, timelines are important, but what is more important for us, Chair, is that there are consequences, consequences for non-delivery. So the point that I've made to the Mineral Council before is that the Minerals Council was bragging just recently to the Portfolio Committee about its $1 trillion turnover uh, or RAN turnover. Uh, and when we look at the kind of projects that the Minerals Council or mining companies generally take on, which generates 1 trillion rands worth of turnover, then those are massive projects, huge, complicated, deeply uh, intense projects. 
Now, when it comes to community development, where they take 0.15% of that, then suddenly this very effective wealth generating industry is not able to manage a billion rands worth of projects. Now that seems to me to be um, a pointer towards risk and reward, right? Mining companies are going to put the energies and make sure that things happen if there's enough reward in it, or if there's enough risk in it that their non-compliance will hurt their bottom line. The fact of the matter is, is that development does not bother them. It is a flea on a massive elephant. elephant. It is of no consequence. It is a mosquito in the ear. They feel nothing for it. So what we are saying is if we want to prioritize development, the penalties and the consequences need to match our, our desire to see development in the sector. So yes, it is about time management, but more importantly, it's about consequences, about the risk and reward. So, you know, for us, that would be the important element in it. Um, um, so part of the timeline question, which the, the regulations around social and labor plans, which the department uh, recently published a couple of years ago, um, is helpful in the sense that it does uh, require regular feedback to communities and structures on a quarterly basis. Now that kind of feedback and systems is important, it's good, it's helpful. But what we need to do is the MPRDA needs to strengthen the, the role that communities can play within those feedback sessions and the requirements upon mining companies about the transparency and the nature of how they report back. So we need to tighten that up and then communities can play a role in helping to manage timelines and helping to hold mining companies to account. Because the fact of the matter is, is that the DMRE does not have the wherewithal to do all of the regulations on their own. So it would be wise in our opinion to rope in communities, to give them uh, additional um, legislative support that will ensure that mining companies are going to be held to account um, so in other words, where uh, an organization is able to, to engage in this quarterly report backs and an organization like Makua can undertake a social and labor, uh, a social audit, you know, let's use those mechanisms to hold the mining companies to account, but it needs legislative backup because at the moment when we do engage with mining companies, they still ignore us because there are no penalties. So, so that's part of the challenge which we need to talk about in more detail and which I'm sure we can't do right now. Um, in terms of the comprehensive consultative the pro process, we agree 100% that there has to be a lot more consultation before it gets to the, to the portfolio committee and before the portfolio committee is put in a position where you were with the gas amendment bill where the DMRE failed to consult with us effectively. Um, and in one instance where the regulations on, on, um, on resettlements and a couple of other things was done, you know, we tried to engage the DMRE and um, they just ignored our inputs. They just kind of um, continued to, 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 to uh, go ahead despite our objections, despite our concerns. Um, and that leads to confrontation and conflict. So what we are saying and what we have proposed to the portfolio committee is let's legislate the process in which there has to be consultative process before it gets to the legislative stage. And that it must include all the relevant stakeholders, including communities in the process, so that when it comes to you, it is not about controversy. It's not about confrontation. You know, it's about process and, and, and advancing. So we think that that must be built into the legislative process so that we can ensure that the, so that that, you know, doesn't become a, a time of, con of confrontation, but rather a time of reconciliation and cohesion. Um, and so, yes, the executive in our mind does carry too much power 
part of what we are asking the committee to, to deal with is to devolve some of that power, to say to the executive that yes, you have the power to give licenses at the final resort and all of that good stuff, but there has to be processes, checks and balances. Any good system will have a check and the balances. The voices of the affected and interested parties must be incorporated, it must be there. Um, and you know we have to have that process. So, so we say build that into the legislative process so that um, when it comes to that public participation period, that it is a period of cohesion, a period of advancing and not of confrontation, as I said. Um, coming to the artisanal mining issues, absolutely we must separate uh, illegal mining and syndicates and, and those uh, organized criminal syndicates from the ordinary people like Papsle Toka, who are basically just trying to put food on the table. There must be a separation, absolutely. Our members, including the members of NAM, are completely opposed to criminal syndicates. We do not uh, propose or suggest or support any activity that seeks to usurp the role of the state. We don't support um, activities that threaten communities in the way that these are to, that these organized crime syndicates do. Um, we work with a lot of communities that are faced with these criminal syndicates. And we have suggested in our proposals to the DMRE, and when the time is right and you are hearing those submissions, we can take you through them. But essentially what we're saying is, again, part of the solution to the syndicates is to involve communities in a more structured, and coherent way. So we're saying that where cooperatives are formed and where, where, for example, they are mining close to communities, that those cooperatives must be accountable to the communities in the same way that a large scale mining company is going to be. They must be accountable to the communities um, for things like pollution, things like, um, you know, uh, the way that their members operate within the community, um, the, the, you know, and, and the things that kind of revolve around that. So there must be a process where in, if a site is allocated to a, a, a cooperative that they are accountable to the community and that the community must be seen to be broadly benefiting from that. In that way, if we involve the communities in that kind of oversight, that kind of participation, the space for illegal syndicates to dominate the vacuum shrinks. We make it smaller and smaller until we are able to deal with the problem in a holistic way. And so we say part of the solution to dealing with the illegal mining is to involve communities in a way. And we've detailed our recommendations in that regard in our submissions to the DMRE, and we're happy to share that with the committee when the time is right or, or upon your request. Um, so we say, yes, let's separate illegal mining. Let's promote uh, proper legal mining through proper cooperatives in which the value and the benefits of those processes accrue to the community as a whole. Um, and yes, we have indicated to the to the to the DMRE with regards to um, underground mining. We have made it clear to them that we believe that the policy must deal with underground mining. If you cannot just ignore this problem, it's not going to go away just because you haven't uh, legislated for it. In fact, it's going to increase. It's going to exponentially grow. So we say there has to be a way to to do this. And what we are saying here, Chair is that there are two things. The DMRE and large-scale mines have not made a plan for what to do after mining. So in many of the towns that we find this, the illegal mining syndicates, it's in towns in which mining is on the decline in a big way. Um, but the large-scale miners and the DMRE have not made a plan to rehabilitate and close off the mines. That's part of the problem. So we say that if in the policy and in the way that we unfold this, this plan, 
that communities are involved in rehabilitating and closing off the mines in the way that I described previously, then we have the opportunity to, again, um, isolate the syndicates and to make the space smaller for them. Um, and over time, it will, we hopefully will get rid of it. But there has to be a, a way to use the existing structures to support communities so that the communities can take control of their own lives and their own situations and, and, and isolate these, 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 these syndicates. Um, and yes, we must target the high level dealers. And that certainly is where we believe the police should put their focus, not on the small uh, people, because our research has also shown that the people at the bottom end of the value chain are not making uh, enormous amounts of money. The miners are going home with maybe three to 5,000 rand a month. The syndicates are the ones who are creaming the profits. So the ordinary persons that the police end up arresting are not, are not the problem, but they become the problem in the, in the, in, if the police are not there. So there has to be uh, an urgent move to formalize miners in a way that there can be a separation between artisanal miners who are within the system and illegal syndicates who are operating with outside of the system. And it has to happen concurrently. So we cannot just go in and arrest people, shoot people uh, indiscriminately. We have to say, let's do all of that, but at the same time, let's formalize these miners. So we know that we're dealing here with, with potential allies and not with potential enemies. And then we can narrow the spaces as we go along. So there has to be a concerted, coherent, holistic approach. Um, uh, yes, so, yeah. So, so we believe that as the legislative, the assessment of legislation proceeds, because you know, it's been 20 years since the law was put in place, the, 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 Jurisprudence has evolved, the political terrain has evolved, the consciousness of mining affected communities has evolved, um, and the whole space is just different. We're dealing with different challenges than we did 20 years ago, and so it's really, it's by time that we do look at the legislation, um, and the more urgent we do it, the better, because the crisis is only growing in the absence of concerted leadership from our political uh, leaders. So I hope that helps to answer some of your questions, Chair. I don't know if any of my colleagues want to touch on any of the issues I might have missed. No. So Chair, I don't know if that uh, provides some kind of response to you that is helpful. No, 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 in the absence of an addition, no, that's fine, Chris, um, we, are, we are here, we, we are engaging, we, I'm sure I always say that the fact that we are members of parliament does not give us natural wisdom on everything. We are here also to get some, some more on what we think. So I don't think even when members were not asking, they are looking at how do we process some of those issues. But uh, before then, I go to close eye and then give the way forward. Are there any last words from you? It can be you, it could be Mr. Mbangula, either of the two of you as leadership of Marco Amor. Yeah, you choose, you, choose, you choose between yourselves. You're yes, true. I'll ask Mr. Mbangula to close off for us, Chair. Thank you very much. Okay. Um... Thank you a lot, uh, Comrade Chair, and the Portfolio Committee as a whole, really for using this day to give us a platform to communicate with you. Uh, we really highly appreciate that. And uh, um, to our comrade in Makua for again joining this meeting, we very highly appreciate that. We believe again that is, uh, if uh, this kind of platform will be open for us, a lot of things will be dealt with in a appropriate way and uh, will open up, up other opportunities for those communities who are not aware of these platforms. And I believe that is if we can work with this way, mining as a big contributor in our community, in, in our in our um, economy, 
will obviously benefit uh, all, everyone that is hosting it. Um, we like to hope and believe that is, uh, we'll have another time to talk again and set things up. Thank you a lot, Chairperson. Thank you, Mako Amor. Um, honorable members, <clears throat> we are almost at the end of our meeting for today. Um, the, the committee uh, will, will revert back to yourselves. Most definitely, uh, can I request again uh, to yourselves, Chris, please don't wait uh, until it's late. We are currently faced with these problems. Send us the, the submissions you have made with regards to the policy on artisanal mining. Um, we will distribute it to every member of the committee so that uh, it informs them uh, going forward. We don't have to discuss and agree as a committee, but it's necessary information to empower them as members of the committee to also get some views. The second one, the issue that you have talked about when it comes to illegal mining, in particular the site that um, is of concern to date, uh, which is uh, the, the organized syndicate or the organized crime or gangs um, or TEF, TEF wars and so forth. And uh, that, that you, you, have submit, you have given to the department, I think it will be, it will be welcome. We take note of the issues that we have raised um, and we will be able to tackle those issues. Some of them, as I've said, that may be beyond the scope of the committee, but they are within the scope of uh, the legislature, which is par parliament, in our case, the National Assembly. I think um, there are areas that I would say we share a common view on that I think it encourages that uh, we must take them with the author, with our own principles. Um, if it means there is a need to review the rules and other things, let's, uh, we will make those, uh, at least I would say, I hope I'll, I'm correct. It encourages the committee to look at uh, reviewing some of the rules of parliament so that they favor effective public participation and uh, also strengthens the effectiveness of committees of parliament in the performance of their task. Uh, at this time, um, I'm sure we have dealt with uh, uh, many of the issues and thank you very much uh, with such a, I think it has been a very constructive engagement and we hope as you have said that we'll continue to <coughs> engage um, like I said, uh, Chris, it's free. I'm always available, but uh, it's better when you talk, you know that you talk to leadership. Feel free to contact me on any other matter. For now, especially that we don't have any better system or official system. In some of these issues, especially when we're going to deal with legislation, I know now in relation to the MPRDA, we have got the upstream petroleum resources development bill that is being proposed by the department. I will say at times don't wait until the formal processes of parliament, because as we've said in the last time, sometimes all these issues are subject to the rules of parliament that are not flexible. There's nothing wrong with that that, we want to bring just a, a two lines. We want to bring to your attention that when the bill or as the bill is going to be presented to yourself, please note that we have got the following. It may not be in terms of the substantive, it can be the procedural matters. Please be made aware that as, a, as, 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 as people who represent mining communities who have not seen public consultations public consultations with the affected with affected communities. One, two, these are the things that we think have not been taken care of. It assists the committee then when it then invites the department to present on its first briefing, to brief the committee on what it is proposed, whether it's a new legislation, whether it's a new amendment. 
to then take those into cognizance. As it takes them into cognizance, it may utilize what you would have given it. For an example, to check, have you consulted? What were the processes? Which areas you went to? You see? So, so that we know that, uh, because I'll be honest with you, even if they speak to Makua Amoa, it doesn't mean they would have consulted the communities because parliament in the main talks about public consultation must go to the people, not to structure, not necessarily. It's not wrong to engage structures, but it must go to the people. So it will help us then to get some of those things so that we preempt some of the, of the exercises. Rather than, for an example, our experience, most of us on the case amendment bill, when you go to people, you will not have asked certain questions to the department because it is presented anew to you. You only, when we public hearings, you go to the people, start to get much more opened up minds that, oh, okay, there's this limit, there's this issue, there's this issue. Now, it means when we come for the second time with the department, to say, what is your take? Unfortunately, we would not have corrected them to say, even before we go and consult with the public, can you go and sort out one, two, and three, and then you can they give you an opportunity to rectify one, two, and three. So my, my request is that even if, we, let's say, even if we don't necessarily stick to our formal procedures, when you have picked up that there is this particular legislation or proposal that might come to the committee. Please give us hints ahead. We're not saying we'll agree with you, but at least you are alerting us so that even by the time we go after engaging the department, by the time we will conduct public hearing, we also know now that um, there are these factors that must be taken into consideration. But um, on, a, on that note, thank you very much. Uh, for this uh, fruitful engagement. Uh, thank you very much, honorable members. Uh, can I then uh, declare the meeting adjourned? The meeting stands adjourned. Thank you. Not yet, Chair. Chair. What is it now? <laughs> Minutes. Ah. Do you, Chair. do you still have the energy for Let me check first, my. One. Remember, some members are, go are going to join the house today. Two, three, four, five. Oh, we are. Can we go to the minutes? Six. Yeah, I can flag, flag them. Chair. Yeah. Yes, my honor of Malina. Are we, are we doing this in front of our guests? Now, minutes every meeting of the committee is uh, open to the public. But they are free to leave if they want to leave. No one must be, can be dismissed. Uh, except if there is someone who recommends or will request an in-camera meeting commit in advance and reasons thereof. Okay. Uh, Honourable members, this is at the minute of the 31st of May. We go. Leave item one, two. Three, four, five. The the only thing, uh, uh, Ari and Ayanda, can you go up? Oh, okay, no, no, that's fine, that's fine. Okay, no, 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 I thought it's about the adoption. Okay. Uh, um, any more for the minutes? I move, Chair. Any seconder? Uh? 
Honorable Marans, are you seconding? I saw that you might want. Thank you very much. Any matters arising, honorable members? Going one, two, three. Okay, nothing. Next set of minutes. One, continue, Ari. <laughs> One, that's two, three, four. When you go up on four, anyway, it's still a matter that we're with. Okay. Um, okay, fine. Any move of the minutes? I move, Chair. Oh, Dumel and I. Dumela Chaperson. <laughs> okay, uh, any second that to honor Bulkula? I, I, I want to second, but I also want to check uh, on, on, the, on the attendance and apologies there. I think as much as I did not start the meeting, I think it's a meeting that I joined late. Uh, I don't know what uh, I might, I'm speaking under correction, but I do know that I uh, uh, started the meeting late in June. It means when the meeting started, you were not present and you did not. Uh, yeah. You did not uh, tender an apology. The only thing you must sort it out, I think, uh, Ayanda and Ari, like where you put put something there. Ne? I think for the sake of the minutes, you must put something like you put on the alternate, you put a, a star, either you put a hashtag, or whatever, for so that we know and it be cleared that joined late or left early, something to that effect. Because as you are correct, uh, somewhere then your, your, your name reflects, but you are, you are absent in the meeting. It might happen that you make and you support the, the decisions, but you are written as if you are absent. I'm sure we'll correct that so that we, we know that uh, that person even if his or her name reflects on the minutes as a contributor in whatever form, then it must reflect that it would be, the reason is, is having you present and absent. It's exactly what you say would have joined the meeting late. Okay, is there any matters arising? Going one, two, three, none. Next set of minutes. Oh, what a break. Uh, one, two, three. Four. <clears throat> okay. Any mover of the minutes? I move, Chair. Any seconder? I do second, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable uh, Von Marans and Honorable Malinga. Any matters arising? None. Let's go to the next set of minutes.
go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, any move of this minute? Yes, Chair. I move. Thank you, Honorable Lorema. Any second? I second, Chair. Thank you very much. And as rising, going one, two, three. The, is there any other minutes arrive even for today's meeting? Okay. No, Chair. In the absence, can I then declare the meeting adjourned? Is that all? Oh, I understand the correspondence, honorable members. We will talk about that uh, when we have got a proper feedback uh, next week uh, with regards to the oversight visit. On that note, honorable members, the meeting stands adjourned. Thank you very much. Till next time. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Chair.